Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Memorials, Monuments, and Memory Lecture at Roanoke College. My name is Justine Ludwig, and I am the Executive Director of Creative Time, a public arts organization that works with artists to contribute to the dialogues, debates, and dreams of our times. Sponsored by the Center for Studying Structures of Race at Roanoke College and co-presented by Creative Time, the Memorials, Monuments, and Memory Lecture Series brings to Roanoke's campus a number of artists, architects, and scholars whose work addresses the role of monuments and memorials in society. Presented in tandem with the spring INQ 300 capstone course by the same name, the series invites students and the public to examine the intersection of art, public memory, and history. The series also precedes planning for the school's commission of a new memorial commemorating the enslaved persons who built the college and contributed to the wider region. The memorial will be developed and presented jointly by the college and creative time. I'd like to thank Jesse Booker, director of the Center for Studying Structures of Race at Roanoke College, and Lacey Leonard, assistant gallery director at the college, for the time and effort they've devoted to bringing this series to fruition. It has been wonderful to be present for the series' past lectures from conceptual artist Charles Gaines, cultural historian and architectural designer Mabel O. Wilson, and historical archaeologist Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. Now, without further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speaker, Nicholas Gallinin. Nicholas's work engages contemporary culture from his perspective rooted in connection to land. He embeds incisive observation into his work, investigating intersections of culture and concept in form, image, and sound. Nicholas's works embody critical thought as vessels of knowledge, culture, and technology, inherently political, generous, unflinching, and poetic. Nicholas engages past, present, and future to expose intentionally obscured collective memory and barriers to acquisition of knowledge. His works critique commodification of culture while contributing to the continuum of clinket art. Nicholas employs materials and processes that expand the dialogue of indigenous artistic production and how culture can be carried. His work is in numerous public and private collections and exhibited worldwide. Nicholas apprenticed with master carvers, earned his BFA at London Guildhall University and his MFA at Massey University. He currently lives and works with his family in Alaska. At the conclusion of his lecture, Nicholas will take questions moderated by Jesse. To take part, please use the Q and A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. You are truly in for a treat tonight. Nicholas, thank you for your presence here and for continuing the lecture series with us today. I'll pass the mic off to you. Welcome. Thank you. And it's Chish, ye hiat seen you hot do a sot. Huknahadi hot city, kagwan tan yadi ayahat, chikakwan. My name is ye hiat seen Nicholas Galan, and I am Huknahadi, child of the kagwan tan people of Sitka. Um, it's great to be here with you all. I'm going to share my screen and share some images with you. Um, this is home. This is where I come from, uh, my ancestral homelands, Sheep Kukwan. Um, I like to start off with these images when I speak about any of the things that I do or any of my work in this continuum. It's uh, such an important piece of understanding um, something greater within the, my practice and my work, uh, I suppose. And that's just the connection to place. And um, this is part of the coastal homes where we live. And then obviously here in the winter, um, a lifestyle a connection to land uh, that many of us know here is uh, subsistence, um, living within the, the seasons and the clock of the season, you know, it doesn't wait for anybody. So the salmon run on the salmon run, we have to be prepared to respond to that. Um, same with, uh, other, other seasons that come through here. Um, 
This is how we feed our families. This is how we've survived since time immemorial. Um, every June, July, the sockeye return and we will dip net the, the fish uh, closely next to bears even, uh, where we process and smoke and put away this um, soul food for, for the rest of the year. You, not only do we feed our families, but extended families as well and elders. This is a large part of uh, the work that I do and um, a large part of the understanding of the, the history and cultural work and the visual language that is foundational to um, my understanding of the world and creative, creative world. So uh, in my studio here, this was a 10 foot um, totem in the process of that. Uh, our totemic art form is um, an ancient visual language that's uh, one of the first creative uh, processes that I'd begun in my journey as an artist. Um, I'm still understanding that language and participating in that continuum and in many ways, I suppose it's a lifelong journey. Um, Here's the 10 foot totem um, in its finished state. Our totemic works um, tell histories, they tell family connections to place, lineage, stories. They're even at times political, um, where shame poles might be raised to um, bring um, awareness to unpaid debt or other 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 things that might um, need memorializing. The uh, photo here is of a uh, village in Juneau, um, Juneau, Douglas, Alaska. So in the 60s, this village was intentionally burnt down um, to make way for uh, the city to build a boat harbor. Um, this was, you know, a very recent example of uh, continued genocide towards indigenous communities, continued displacement of our communities. Um, there are elders that are alive now that were, you know, children then that have, you know, very, um, that still have their memories and experience of that removal, that forced removal. And it was a story that had largely been um, ignored as part of even the erasure of our histories and um, our realities for not only land rights, um, but even access to subsistence and fishing, hunting rights, et cetera. Uh, I was asked in 2017, I believe, maybe it was 2018, to um, create a coutier, a totem pole for the community um, as a healing pole on site of that village. Um, not only was this the first time that the the community had acknowledged that history, but um, it was the first time that the elders got to, you know, celebrate um, the site, their stories, their connection to place. For me, the healing of this totem took place in a lot of different ways. Um, one was activating um, the culture through a form of you know master apprenticeship um, dialogue where seven apprentices were trained during this process um, for me that's a very uh, necessary demonstration of how our culture remains um, and lives on so you know these 
connections where these apprentices have been trained in this process. They'll continue to potentially carry this language and this process um, for, for future generations. So, and then of course the um, engagement where working closely with elders to tell their stories um, and to, you know, bring our culture and our visual language back to the very site of that village. So um, is it uh, restitution or is it, you know, any anything else other than that? Not quite to the extent I, I would say, you know, there's, um, we'll get into conversations further on um, the trends of institutions and land acknowledgement um, and who, do, who, who those may serve uh, versus the realities of the communities that are still faced with uh, landlessness, et cetera. So um, this was one more project I wanna share with you. Um, we just finished carving this. This was the first time I'd been a lead carver on a, a yacht, a canoe, a dugout canoe. And it was a 10 month project. So if you see the red cedar tree above and then the finished um, canoe below, it's um, quite a process to get to this stage. So that tree is older than America. And um, the whole of the canoe is shaped, formed, and then it's steamed. Um, steamed open so that you have a wider vessel at the end of the project that's a little more seaworthy. Um, canoes to me, from a utilitarian standpoint, culturally speaking, were some of the most significant forms and technology in our, you know, um, in wood that carvers would create. You know, they had to survive, they had to work in very treacherous uh, oceans or seas and coastline. They had to transport people safely. Um, they provided, they, you know, there's so many different metaphors, I suppose, for what a canoe could be. Um, but they did, they provided sustenance to the community. They brought people together. They were utilized in warfare. They were utilized in travel and trade. Um, there was a time in the history of uh southeast alaska here where these dugout canoes were literally lining the beaches um obviously through colonization um the, not only has the canoes um disappeared but even you know the practice of making them um and now today the um the old growth cedar that we utilize for you know these culture for cultural use is becoming more and more difficult to um, access through uh, logging essentially so clear cutting of old growth um, forests which seems like a one-way street where you know these trees will grow for 1500 years or so and um to remove those and to remove that forest is um not something that we can get back right away so what have we become this is 2000 pages cut and bound from anthropological text um the work is a series that i had begun um, probably 2006, somewhere around there. I started making some of this work. Um, the concept of this piece has a lot of, has several layers to it, but um, primarily when I first started, I recognized as I traveled um, and as I studied abroad, as I sought access to our cultural objects, our ad u, you know, the, 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 those would be the objects that many might see in museums. Um, I realized that most of our objects had been removed from our communities. This was part of a part of 
continued genocide, uh, not only removing us from land, not only removing our children from our families, um, our language from our mouths, um, removing our connection to that land, um, physically, spiritually, um, but also, you know, removing all of the ceremonial objects that we had we had created for our communities. Those objects, oftentimes known as at who, um, didn't have a Western ownership. They were, you know, they belonged to our grandchildren's grandchildren. So they were, um, they were not something that could be sold or necessarily taken or owned in that sense. Through colonization, that changed dramatically. Um, during that process of uh, documenting our culture through it, understanding and reading anthropological text, taking note that many of those perspectives were white or not from our communities, um, and understanding how damaging that could be with the history of uh, white supremacist systems and beliefs in anthropology. Um, this series was looking at that and the irony of our culture coming from a uh, customarily oral based history, you know, our, we, our, our history was carried through song and through visual art and sculpture um, and oral based storytelling. Um, so to see it homogenized through academia, um, that's uh, what some of this work was taking a look at too. The um, reality of this process was that oftentimes it even, um, even our words were, our elders' words were not um, considered uh, are taken seriously unless they had gone through a homogenization of academia. Um, so again, it's this extraction. In this case, it was not the extraction of um, an object, it was an extraction of knowledge. And that carries on into um, current day practice in our communities where our resources are extracted. Um, and the same, the same knowledge and the same words from elders is purposefully ignored um, if it doesn't align with the economic uh, needs of that resource extraction. So, i.e., a local herring fishery that's happening in Southeast Alaska today um, is being heavily depleted and mismanaged um, by the federal and state management uh, fisheries management and we have recordings of elders 20 years ago that are no longer with us that tell stories of you know how abundant the herring had been in our communities though if that knowledge does not serve economic goals then it becomes you know myth in that sense so to those that write those stories Oops, go back. Hey, 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 hey. 
So this is a two-part um, video work titled Suhedi Shugartitan. I'm That was part one. I'm going to go ahead and play part two for you now. Oops, I keep hitting that. So these two video um, loops titled Suhedi Shugak Titan translates to, we will again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. And um, for me, the work uh, is based on the philosophy of, you know, what's been left in our care and, and what that container might be and um, what it means to you know, open that up. Oftentimes what I've found and find is that our indigenous culture is heavily romanticized, um, based and um, perpetuated by, you know, these ideas of authenticity. Um, and those ideas start in those anthropological books and carry on through stereotype, they carry on through forms of um, what is or what isn't um, to come from a place. And that romanticization uh, 
is dehumanizing oftentimes through um, trying to freeze a community or living culture in the past. Um, the dehumanization of these communities and cultures um, took place and started uh, in a lot of, for a lot of different reasons. One uh, obviously was uh, the process of this idea of manifest destiny where um, our terra nullis, which where our indigenous communities are part of the environment and fauna, less than human. Um, that language still carries on even to this day where, um, you know, presidents of the United States refer to those on the other side of a um, imaginary border as uh, animals. You know, that has a long history of um, continued dehumanization where these borders have, you know, crossed indigenous communities um, that are still impacted by, by that to this day. So this work, Suhedi Shugak Titan speaks to that through, um, through creative or sovereign power and this idea that we can be how we have to be um, as we experience the world. And we will continue to do that. Um, oftentimes the culture and the work and the um, visual language and art is um, replicated. Um, it's um, oftentimes it's um, done so to um, extract economic benefits from that, et cetera. Um, though what cannot be replicated is our experience and our response to those um, realities. And this work is that, so. Um. Fair Warning um, is a photographic and audio series of works. Um, I had visited, you know, uh, as a student to the culture, having um, traveled extensively for my work and studies, oftentimes we would, I would find myself in institutions and museums just to gain access to historical objects, just to gain access to um, these ceremonial objects that come from our communities, um, to experience them and to see them, obviously out of context, but in these spaces. Um, Fair Warning is a series that photographs empty museum um, cabinets that once held our objects. Um, Fair Warning is a call to return our objects back to our communities. I know there is very bureaucratic ways of doing so now through NAGPRA, et cetera, but it's still, um, it's still not enough. Um, still a lengthy process and it's still set up to return our objects on standards or ideas that have been implemented and created um, without our communities in mind oftentimes. So um, the equivalent of that would be me, you know, stealing something from you and saying you can have it back, but you have to, you know, do this or this or this to care for it or to, 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 to be able to you know, return it back to your community or your home. Um, this work in this series, these photographs are um, not necessarily only envisioning and helping imagine, you know, what that would look like. They're literally doing so. And the audio that was recorded that plays in this, I don't know if I have it. And, um, Let's see if this plays. Go 35, 35, 38, 3,800 now. 3,800 now, go four. 3,800 is the bid, four will be next. We all done all through at 3,800, yes or no, at 3,800, fair warning. So I recorded hours of audio um, from auctions 
from auction houses happening now today of indigenous objects uh, and a uh, look at the trafficking of our objects, um, the wealth building of around that exchange without us. Again, um, some of these objects will, you know, sell on Sotheby's, et cetera, for mil millions of dollars. And then the irony of our living artists that are making work from communities and cultures, um, having very little access or um, representation in uh, current cultural collections of modern art. Um, oftentimes, a lot of our work historically had been categorized heavily as ethnographic um, and in uh, institutions like science museums, natural history museums, et cetera, all while the continual um, borrowing or appropriation, or misappropriation of our language, of our forms um, to be consumed by, you know, artists that would be uh, represented in those spaces, um, starting whole abstract movements even. So a fair warning, um, looks at this. this the, these display cases were shot at the Natural History Museum in New York, where thousands of cultural objects have been on display for 75 plus years. And I'm currently doing a series of works furthering this while, while I was over there visiting the museum and the archives, of course, going through collection notes. Um, and the irony of provenance of, you know, Oftentimes, what was more important and highlighted was who collected it, opposed to you know where the what the object was or who may have even created that object or its use or name. Um, but the language used on those collection cards too um, was and continues to be you know it frames our our existence today and. Um, very telling ways, I suppose, where something in the, on a collection card would say collected from a grave of a of a shaman. Um, and, you know, we would call that theft, um, not collected. So go 35. These are some mono prints of um, from a, a recent show at Davidson College in North Carolina. Um, the mono print making process for me is um, very gestural and comes from a, a space of memory. Um, I refer to this memory in everyday living in connection to place through uh, as a foundation to understanding um, core elements and aspects of you know, the culture and the art, I suppose, but that memory for me is um, harvesting berries and that process of picking them, or um, that memory is the swinging of an ads and what that rhythm is and how it's tied directly to your heartbeat as you're doing this process of creating um, these forms or the tools that are used and how we make those tools from from um, and understanding what that is to make those tools the process of uh, skinning a salmon and um, playing it and that the I think of it as a form of joy that can't really be um, it can't be captured in a photograph or a drawing or an image it's just a fleeting feeling that goes through you and you can acknowledge it as it passes but uh passes through but that's about it and i i feel like these this process of printmaking for me has been the closest form of trying to explore that and visualize it um while connecting to it still
We Dreamt Death. This is a polar bear shot in the 60s in Shishmaroth, Alaska by a white sport hunter. Um, previous to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, obviously we can't, that can't happen anymore um, around these spots, but We Dreamt Death is a is a polar bear hide melting in the, in the hind quarter. It's a uh, reference to, um, well, Shishmaroff literally has a, a village in Alaska that is impacted by climate crisis today um, and facing relocation due to the permafrost uh, melting and the erosion of that coastline. Um, these northern communities um, these species that we share them with are uh, impacted by a greater uh, population or from, from different different space or place and and we understanding and considering what that connection impact might be uh, or not understanding it hence the title death we dreamt death we can't hear we don't hear these things so Uh, the value of sharpness when it falls is uh, porcelain hatchets. This is an extension of a series titled We Dreamt Death. Um, we, or not We Dreamt Death, or I Dreamt I Could Fly. I Dreamt I Could Fly I was uh, 60 porcelain arrows flying through the sky. And it's this representation of the tools that indigenous communities are often given um, I shouldn't even say given, honestly, we had to fight for them um, to even access them under colonial um, and, and under ongoing um, settler occupation of indigenous lands uh, where native Alaskans were not allowed to vote, vote until, recent, until uh, mid 1900s. Um, and even then, in order to vote, we had to have signatures from five white people um, to vouch for that native. Uh, so these tools of oppression and the structure of it, um, which is continually used to uh, extract um, and to remove our communities from place, um, the value of sharpness when it falls is, even though these hatchets might not uh, serve or serve as a, a tool that could provide either protection or any, any other means of uh, use, the shards from the hatchets um, will still have use and value as they will be, you know, small usable objects that could still cut. So. I wanted to share this image with you. Um, this is a photograph of the anti-police brutality and um, Black Lives Matter uh, movement that's been sweeping, you know, the world globally, but also the U.S. And this was taken in 2020, I believe. Um, in the photo is the brother of John T. Williams. Um, John T. Williams was extrajudicially murdered by Seattle police officer Ian Burke 10 years prior to this photograph. So, you know, these um, conversations in our communities are not new. They've not, <clears throat> they're not, um, they're realities that have been ongoing even beyond that time. Um, these uh, statistics of being incarcerated as an indigenous man is significantly higher for all of us. The statistics of being murdered by a police officer, um, significantly higher. The statistics of missing and murdered indigenous women uh, is 
higher than any other demographic. Um, these are not, uh, this is not chance. This is design and colonial design of violence, of genocide that's continued in service through um, the occupation of indigenous lands to this day still. So during that time, I was invited out to the Biennale of Sydney to um, create a work. Um, so I went out for a few research trips. I was able to visit the Tiwi Islands. Um, I was able to visit where the first actual European ship landed, which was up in the Tiwis. Uh, not, uh, it, it wasn't Cook as um, celebrated in the, the, the narrative of Australia. Um, but like the US um, and many other countries, uh, colonial countries, uh, with colonial government, the narratives are still upheld and celebrated in, in ways that we would see similar to the 4th of July, et cetera. And um, in Hyde Park, uh, there is a statue uh, of Captain Cook. It's a, you know, a discovery monument, the, the literal um, the plaque on it, cites discovery. Uh, the, obvious um and it should be obvious to to many of it is that you know in order to uh hold that narrative of discovery there's there's a <clears throat> whole lot of erasure and um happening in that same sentence in that same idea um, and the erasure that is happening is one that's continually um happening here in the US even uh, with the dialogue of Columbus or you know any of any other founding father narratives of of um, where or who built a nation um, and what violence was taken or needed to do so so uh, the work created for the Biennale Sydney was Shadow on the Land and Excavation and Bush Burial. It was a um, excavation of the shadow of the Cook statue a monument. Um, the excavation of it was done in an anthropological form. The concept of the work is to excavate the piece deep enough to um, bury it and to bury that narrative. Um, the experience that was happening around, you know, not only uh, Sydney at the time, but also here in the U.S. was contesting these narratives of uh, whose who's heroes and whose side of the story is being shared and told and upheld um, in these spaces. Um, in the U.S., it, with the Confederate monuments that have been slowly um, removed from from public space, the another example of one would be the um, Roosevelt statue outside the Natural History Museum in New York. Uh, you know, racist depictions of of uh, supreme white leaders uh, next to uh, kneeling. Uh, Native Americans are, or um, these are depictions that we see time and time and through and through, through uh, the white supremacist beliefs of uh, history uh, that are being upheld while continually burying the other reality that there is. Um, when you do dig down into this soil, uh, evidence of once, you know, some of the oldest living civilizations uh, on, on earth um, who have and still are deeply connected to these places. Um, the irony of this piece too that uh, is I was only, you know, allowed to dig so deep. If I dug deeper, I'd be hitting contaminated soil. Um, that contaminated soil is a representation of, you know, 
colonial extraction and these these continued goals of that resource extraction at this expense on indigenous land uh, that reality is still something that faces our communities every day i showed you that totem pole piece earlier on from the 60s of our re forced removal um, that uh, is something that could be seen through Standing Rock, where you know, oil uh, pipelines are purposefully pushed through indigenous waterways, indigenous land, um, where uh, reservations even, how the history of reservations and how our communities have been displaced. Reservations are internment camps for indigenous people. They're places that removed communities from what was sought after or thought to be valuable land. And uh, and then if a reservation had been deemed you know, valuable, then there would be another form of that removal again. Never Forget was a work um, in 2021 that uh, was created for Desert X Biennial. Um, this work was, you know, it was three years in the making um, from, you know, planning and trying to realize uh, the piece. It's a uh, life size to scale replica of the Hollywood land sign. Um, except this is in Palm Springs. So my first visit out to Palm Springs, which is Agua Caliente, Cahia land and history was of, again, um, which narrative of history is being told and and what's being erased and that's and that. And um, it was very apparent to me that the local history that is, um, you know, highly visible through tourism, et cetera, was, was one of Hollywood's getaway um, playground. Um, and even a reference to pop culture and Hollywood in its own as, as a you know, problematic institution that has highly uh, misrepresented indigenous uh, narratives, history, and peoples um, to stereotype to cowboy and Indian, to um, you know, the bad guy, et cetera. The irony of this is that uh, Hollywood land, the actual iconic Hollywood sign that many of us know today was uh, first erected as a land real estate advertisement signage to um, sell indigenous land to uh, white only, uh, communities. So uh, embedding that into this work, this work, never forget, speaks on not only the terminology of Indian being utilized by the United States government as a form of um, removing over 500 distinct indigenous cultures through, um, through legal language, um, but also a um, this is a call to return land. So land, the land back movement, which um, if you're familiar with or not is, um, this was a call for all landowners to return land back to indigenous uh, communities. And then obviously it was also a, uh, a fundraiser had been set up and it put in place to um, go to the, uh, NALC, Native American Land Conservancy, which the goal is to buy and acquire indigenous title or land title and return it back to indigenous um, ownership. Even though the the exchange of legal title still is not necessarily, um, it's you know it's still taxable and it's still controlled by government entities in that sense. So this is some imagery from the work. And then I believe 50, 50 over 50,000 was raised. Um, 
the work itself was really telling um, in the participation of uh, audiences in the TikTok era and a selfie hashtag Instagram um, era where you know so many people participated via social media in the work uh, and that percentage was much less through the actual work which was this you know was to um call for action beyond land acknowledgement um and that's a conversation that happens and has been happening more and more in these uh cultural institutions and academic institutions is is um do you have a land acknowledgement if so um who you worked with in that community to build that and and what are you doing to go beyond just that acknowledgement because you know I, if there's no action following that then it's um not serving anybody with the people that are you know saying that acknowledgement architecture of return escape the metropolitan museum this is an ongoing series of works um blueprints of um blueprints for removal or removal of all of our cultural objects from these institutional spaces um so it's a floor map of where they are and then it's uh um obviously getting them out of that space so um Ixacan, this is a recent uh, video piece that had been commissioned by MTV um, and is now in the Brooklyn Museum's collection. Um, the work had shown at Times Square recently. And I'm going to try to play the video for you. I was having a little bit of an issue earlier. Um, in light of these histories that I share with you, um, in light of the stories of the, the, you know, the uh, heaviness and the, the trauma that could be um, seen or in, in these communities, it's really important for me to remind you that when we talk about uh, ugly histories like um, boarding schools and the mass graves that they're continually finding at these resident residential Indian boarding schools where children were forcefully removed from their families in this kill the Indian, save the man uh, genocide towards our communities um, to you know remove cultural language, remove spirit from our children. Um, it's a reminder that that's not our history. When I when I share those stories, that's 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 white Christian history. That's that's um, that's not on us. We didn't create those spaces. Um, we were subject to them. We were placed in those. Um, the uh, work here during that time was um, at a time where the, you know, these grave counts kept growing and showing up uh, of, um, you know, these investigations to these boarding schools and the numbers of children. I mean, <clears throat> how many uh, schools and why do schools have graves? <laughs> that, that was like, that, why it, those are the questions, but I wanted to create work that um, moved away from some of this in a way. Um, and for this piece, it was a 30 second video. If you're familiar with art clips, MTV art clips, um, I suggest that if you're not familiar, or even if you are, go back and Google and YouTube some of the historic ones. It's, it's quite a legacy of artists and work uh, to do these very quick brief videos and for this for this video was um, 
This is my son, Atugani, and I'm speaking uh, words that we say in this home. Um, they're loving words, their language that uh, I would consider the children in these boarding schools um, were robbed from that, that care and that love and that language. Um, and it's just, and then it's just his, you know, his response and expression to these. I don't know why it's pausing. Well, I just have to keep it in play. Sorry, it's not this choppy. Let me see if I can share it on a, a different uh, platform real quick. I know I have a quick time and I can probably play it in that. Sorry. Aha, let's try this. Ich se khan. Tlak ayanach ikhil nuks. Kte ye dne. Ich se khan aktu gne ye. Gnuk yuk ek ek away wa a dat iti nach sak iti akseit kidak tush. So I think that one worked out for you. I'm going to stop sharing here and go back to looking up. But I think I'm ready for questions here soon too. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Yeah, let's do questions. Do you want me to just read these off and then answer yeah, them? Is that... Am I back on the screen with you there, Nicholas? Yeah. Okay, so... let me change my view. Sorry about that. Um, well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Really wonderful to hear the, the depth of the, the contribution that you, that you shared with us tonight. So I'll start with the first question from one of our audience members and others should feel like they can upload the questions there to the Q&A as you talk. Um, so the first question is about the process. So it reads, what is the process that you take when designing a piece and or an exhibit of new work? How long does the planning take? And how long does it normally take you to conduct the piece and or the exhibit? Yeah, the process always changes um, as my work does. And, you know, that's intentional, obviously. I, um, I don't want to do the same thing over and over. And I don't want to hold the same conversations forever. These, um, the, the power of creating work at times can mean that I'm relieved from having to continually answer you know, and catch people up to speed on certain things or to 101 my way through. Um, and um, so, yeah, it varies. Um, that canoe took 10, uh, 10 months with a crew. Um, 
the act of creating in so many mediums also means that I'm continually experimenting and listening to potential ideas. Uh, some work's labor intensive in time and some work happens swiftly, uh, but, but the process of staying open-minded is continual. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question was about um, what's next in the work that you're in the process of making. Um, and I know there were some questions from the students in my class about Unshadowed Land, the project at Davidson College. Sure. Let's do one question at a time. Uh, the um, yeah, I, I've got I've actually have work up right now at Davidson College uh, that's ongoing. It's a year long piece titled, as you said, Unshadowed Land. Um, and uh, um, that work is an extension of Shadow on the Land, an excavation of bush burial in a lot of ways, uh, instead of, a, you know, the statue that I'm working with, the, the monument I'm working with for that piece is Andrew Jackson's statue at Lafayette Square. And uh, Andrew Jackson was a terrible person um, who's um, still, you know, upheld and celebrated in uh, a colonial, narrative and history. Um, for this work, I wanted to take th that shadow of that statue and uh, instead of focusing on, um, I guess, all of the heavy things that follow and fall under that, uh, you know, his legacy and history, um, to focus on the resilience of our community and to focus on the fact that we are still here doing and uh, working within our communities, uh, despite, you know, all of the um, even legislation that was in place to, to remove us from doing so. So um, in that work, I'm working with the uh, Catawba um, tribal community, and we are cultivating Catawba corn, which is, um, you know, was thought to be a extinct or lost um, seed. Um, but, you know, again, in line with when I shared with you some of our, our subsistence and process of surviving and connection to place here on land uh, with the smoked salmon imagery, you know, Catawba, like many indigenous communities have also very close connections and ties to seasons and places. And um, so we are planting those uh, and cultivating it in the shape of the shadow of, of Jackson's uh, monument and statue. And the, uh, the, so a shadow is, you know, blocking out the sun or the light to get, get the image, but unshadowed land where, you know, utilizing that to grow this crop. Um, not only are we growing this crop in that form and that shape and documenting it stages, but we're also doing a much larger portion of it on a, another larger plot of land so that we can harvest it all and then bring the community together. So it, there's a lot of different mechanisms working in that. Um, so I, I feel like it was just a natural extension to continue that work in a different way, in a different place. So. Um, other projects right now, I've got um, a solo show exhibition opening uh, at Peter Bloom Gallery in New York, on May 7th. So I've been working really like continual on new pieces for that, new works, and uh, it feels good to be um, in this space and mind frame doing that type of work right now. So yeah. Thank you. Nicholas, our next question is, you mentioned a shame totem and a healing totem. Are there other totems and what is the reaction to the shame totems? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different types of uh, totemic works, I suppose. And um, the, there, there was, you know, there were 
guardian figures that were carved to uh, stand watch over like a medicine man or woman's grave. Um, there are uh, totems that document different histories. There's totems that are, you know, now being replicated to, you know, replace older stories that have been go ongoing. So, um, but yeah, I, I think, a, I mean, a, a shame totem would go up until its debt was paid and then it could come back down. So, and then it's, uh, yeah. Good, thank you. And there's two more questions. Um, the next one is, um, thanks you for your presentation. It says, could you speak a little bit more about the architectures of escape series, both the specific objects and the larger scope of that series? Uh, the objects, there's over 60,000, 100,000 objects probably. There's more objects in these institutional spaces than there are in our communities that came from our communities. And that's not referencing the remains, the indigenous remains that are in these institutions. You know, there's uh, a lot of our graves were um, raided and dug up and, and placed into these spaces. Um, um, so that's, you know, that, that's what this work is, is about. You know, it, at some point, these institutions are going to have to, um, you know, address these histories and, um, and they're, it's going to have to be more than just what NAGPRA or whatever is implemented to returning said object for, for an institution in a museum space to grow. It has to, mm -hmm. it can't, it can't, um, maintain that and, and continue it. So, um, but that's what that work, that's what that work is really so that and it's mapping it out and pointing out these institutions that are participating in it. so yeah good and i'll read here the final question before i offer a closing so the, the final question is how hard and or easy uh, was it to acquire permissions to do the cook statue excavation while in tiwi land what did you think about the uh i'll mispronounce this but pokemani poles or the funeral poles and the person asking the question was curious about what differences and commonalities you see between those poles and other totem poles. Um, the Cook statue excavation, it was originally intended to happen at Hyde Park directly with the statue and we couldn't get permission to do it there. Um, so that's how hard it was, I suppose, but it actually worked out. Uh, I feel like the work was better without the without the statue there. So we, you know, it was on Cockatoo Island, Cockatoo Island, and um, the location was really suitable for this piece in a lot of ways. For me, I think it was important to uh, and more impactful to exclude this statue in this piece. Um, such lazy uh, narrative to say we'll. If we'll lose our history if you remove it. I feel like there was more in-depth, engaged conversation and dialogue uh, potentially through, you know, a piece like this than with just the statue itself being there. So um, as far as the Tiwi visit, it was incredible. Um, I, you know, was um, able to travel quite a bit around that space with some of the artists and and uh, to yeah see some of the, the poles there you know it's very that the, there we did have more mortuary poles here in our community so if there was something similar I think that would be uh, that would be it um, so I have a memory of them you know always speaking to their ancestors as they passed by and that was always really uh, great to see I suppose but um, yeah, I feel like a lot of our communities have a lot of, you know, shared similarities of connection to place and, and, and the spaces that I feel like is, um, you know, they might not be the same, but they're <clears throat> connected.
connecting points for sure. So, yeah. But, well, thank you for answering the questions this evening. So I'll just offer a few words of closing. Um, on behalf of Roanoke College and the Center for Studies and Structures of Race, I'd like to thank our speaker, Nicholas Gallinum, for his wonderful presentation. Thanks also to our audience for attending and asking such thoughtful questions. Special appreciation this evening goes to our partners at Creative Time, Justine Ludwig, Natasha Logan, and Lizzie Smith for organizing this lecture, and to Tanya Ridpath and Lacey Leonard here at Roanoke College for handling the event logistics. I hope that our audience members will register for the final lecture in this series uh, next Tuesday, April 19th at 6.30 p.m. with Henry Louis Gates Jr. And to all of you, have a wonderful evening and many thanks to you, Nicholas. Thank you. Give me cheese.